It's my privilege to introduce my esteemed colleague, Reverend Dr. Jessica Chapman Lape, for a lecture on interreligious engagement, bridging the classroom and the community, which I think was the, the focus of the last question. So uh, we perfectly timed this for you. So uh, Reverend Dr. Jessica Chapman Lape is the Assistant Professor of Interreligious Chaplaincy and the Program Director of the Interreligious Chaplaincy Program here at United. And she has applied her extensive background in health education and community health to her work as a chaplain, faith leader, and scholar. A womanist pastoral theologian, she received her PhD from Claremont School of Theology with an award-winning dissertation which focused on the experiences and mistreatment of black women within the healthcare system here in the United States. She's also ordained in the United Church of Christ. Je you can read more details in, the, in your program, but let me just say it, uh, that Jessica is passionate about education. She's elegant in her course design. She creates the most beautiful videos for her classes. And she's a deeply thoughtful faculty member. She's just ending her term as the faculty moderator for this academic year. And I can also testify that she is the kind of wonderful colleague who says yes to a wide range of endeavors uh, that she's invited to, including joining chaplains at a street protest against police brutality, co-leading a Bible study for the United Community, and even dragging our slightly grumpy older dogs to see Santa Claus. So please join me in welcoming the Reverend Dr. Jessica Chapman Lape. All right, good morning. Thank you, Dr. Steve Utanis, for the introduction. Thank you, Dr. Cindy Beth Johnson, for the invitation to share on such an exciting and important topic to the spirit of United. The occasion of United Days calls for a celebration of the diverse ecumenical and interreligious voices that contributed to the life of this seminary, and I'm excited to celebrate this diversity alongside each of you today. Dr. Murad and I are a good praxeological pairing this morning, as his talk centered around the theoretical and philosophical grounding for interreligious engagement. And I am bringing in the practice. So just for a moment, imagine that you all right here and on Zoom are a class. And this is the first day of your term. Welcome. Take a look around at your classmates. These are your classmates for the day. <laughs> so, class, we will open our session by participating in a ritual rooted in the spiritual tradition of your classmate. Then we will get to know one another by sharing about our spiritual or philosophical traditions. And by the end of the class session, you will be assigned an interreligious peer and this will be someone who practices a spiritual or philosophical tradition outside of your own. You'll meet with your assigned peer on a weekly basis for about 30 minutes. And during that time, you'll discuss course content, practice spiritual care across religious difference, and explore how it feels to be in relationship with someone occupying a tradition perhaps unknown to you. All right, scene. You're no longer students, but that is how I typically begin my classes here, centered around interreligious engagement. So take a moment and consider how you felt when hearing those opening remarks and instructions. Were you energized by the vast religious exposure that was to come? Or were you nervous about experiencing the unknown potentially exposing yourself to something you might consider evil or bizarre. Or perhaps as a religious minority, you began to dread the thought of divulging your own religious location. You may wonder if it's safe or if you'll be judged. Or you may have thought to yourself, what in the world would I talk to a stranger about for 30 minutes a week? These are questions, among many others, no doubt, that my students ponder when entering the interreligious classroom. At United, we think of the term interreligious in two ways. First, interreligious describes the religious diversity of our students, 
Our classrooms are composed of students from a myriad of religious, spiritual, and philosophical locations. Interreligious also describes how we train students to engage the religious diversity they encounter in their vocational contexts. Our curriculum explores a range of voices and perspectives to prepare students for a multi-faith world. The lane I occupy here at United is interreligious chaplaincy. Although historically rooted in Christianity, the field of chaplaincy is now comprised of representatives from many traditions. Chaplains are religious professionals and spiritual leaders working outside of religious settings to provide emotional, spiritual, and ethical support within institutions and systems. Chaplains work in a variety of sectors, including healthcare, prisons, nonprofit organizations, corporate settings, educational institutions, the government, just to name a few. Chaplains have extensive educational and practical training, much of which we offer here at United, and they learn and utilize skills in pastoral counseling, grief theory, ethics, family systems theory, and more. And apart from the mastery of theoretical and interpersonal skills, chaplains must also integrate a deep knowledge of the spirituality that grounds them in their work and a general knowledge of multiple religious traditions that they may encounter in their work. Our interreligious chaplaincy students, much like many of United students, prepare for meaningful work within communities that may mirror their lived religious and sociocultural identities, or within communities that may differ from, challenge, or decenter their religious worldview. The ever-shifting North American religious landscape warrants the expectation of vast religious diversity when serving in the public sphere. Pastoral theologians and care providers Dagmar Graffi and Pamela McCarroll write, for chaplains who serve in public institutions, interreligious literacy is growing in importance, enabling them to tap into systems of meaning embedded in the symbols, stories, sacred texts, and rituals of diverse spiritual wisdom traditions. From United, students will become chaplains in nonprofits where they play with the children of a Hmong family who just lost their home. From United, students will become chaplains in hospitals where they baptize Christian infants with worried and tired parents. From United, students will become chaplains in universities, counseling young adults exploring paganism for the first time. From United, students will become chaplains in prisons, reciting the Quran with Muslim inmates. And from United, students will become chaplains in the military, officiating their Buddhist comrade's funeral. So simply stated, in the 21st century, interreligious engagement is inevitable. So how do we use the interreligious classroom to prepare students to engage interreligious communities. Interreligious engagement involves exposure and exploration. Students ought to be exposed to diverse religious and philosophical traditions whilst exploring the role of religion and spirituality in the cultural structures of institutions and in the lives of care receivers. The interreligious classroom then serves as a container or as a play space, to quote my colleague, Dr. Gary Green, for students to be exposed to and explore aspects of religious diversity that are relevant to their vocational practice. So I will offer three examples of learning activities from my interreligious classroom, but I will not be a good theological pedagogue if I did not first outline my pedagogical or andragogical approaches to interreligious engagement. So first, my approach is student-centered. My role in the classroom is to frame, prompt, and facilitate the wisdom already in the room. This approach resists the normative banking and depository teaching models rooted in Western academic elitism and hierarchy. Instead, I curate and make accessible learning materials relevant to course topics, whilst myself learning from the wisdom of students and adjusting learning materials to meet their ever-flowing curiosities. In the interreligious classroom, students have great sources of knowledge in the seats right next to them. 
Students bring with them their lived experiences and their lived religion, their full selves in all of its intersections and complexities, and are invited to offer their wisdom and receive the wisdom of their peers, not just from their professor. My approach is womanist. I believe the sentiment in Zora Neale Hurston's work, Their Eyes Were Watching God, that black women are the mules of the world. Mules who carry a burden of strength, mules whose wellness is often ignored, mules whose faculties are exploited until they are discarded, mules who are subhuman. And from an intersectional lens, it's not just black women, right? It's the poor, non-Christian, non-English speaking, disabled, uneducated, black, trans woman immigrant. And it is exactly from her vantage point that we must view the significance of our theological work. We must align our spiritual care practices to be relevant and effective to care for who many Christian traditions describe as the least of these. And if we can prepare students to provide ethical and culturally compassionate spiritual care to the mules of the world, to the least of these, our students will be prepared to care for everyone. My approach is personal. It hinges upon my own identity as a spiritually fluid person. Growing up, I was formed by the mainline Protestant traditions of my family, Black Presbyterian, PCUSA, and Black UCC congregations shaped my Christian theological perspective to be rooted in justice, community, and liberation. I was also formed by the folklore, superstitions, and everyday rituals that passed through my family and my culture for generations. These traditions and beliefs some call hoodoo were birthed from West African spirituality, strengthened through the insidiousness of slavery, and preserved as that which sustained generations of people despite harrowing circumstances. My own spiritual fluidity, my own interreligious life holds me accountable in my attempt at fostering authentic pathways for interreligious engagement. My approach is decolonial. A decolonial epistemology works to interrupt traditional roles of the knower and the known, where the knower, often occupying a dominant social identity, asserts an all-access pass to intimate knowledge held by those outside of their cultural location. The keepers and producers of that intimate knowledge, often those occupying marginalized or minority social identities, then become the known, relegated into passivity as their knowledge is disseminated and received by those whom it was never intended. A decolonial epistemology therefore challenges students who often adopt knower ideologies to resist the assumption of access. An academic approach to interreligious engagement does not instantly grant students access to the intricacies and complexities of ancient rituals, beliefs, and practices. One does not, and in my opinion should not, always have access to another person's sacred. My approach is inspired by care. I am a chaplain with a love for listening to stories and with a call to care deeply for people's spirits. And with that love and that call comes a set of practical skills that support my work, including reflective listening, reframing, and presence, non-anxious and non-judgmental presence. I believe that a key to students feeling safe enough or brave enough to engage into religiosity, to expose themselves to religious diversity, and to deeply explore traditions, including their own, involves curating the interreligious classroom through the lens of a chaplain caring for her community. And in my approach, in my listening, in my reframing, in my presence, I model to students the efficacy and transformational power of those skills in an interreligious environment. So student-centered, womanist, personal, decolonial, and care-inspired. This is how I approach the interreligious classroom. And from this framework, in conversation with broader curricular goals and pragmatic learning outcomes, 
come learning activities that invite students to engage into religiosity in meaningful and productive and authentic ways. So here are three examples of learning activities from the interreligious classroom that facilitate a student's exposure to and exploration of interreligiosity in preparation for a vocation and interreligious engagement. The first is an opening spiritual activity. This is a student-led centering ritual or spiritual care practice at the beginning of a class session. And here, students facilitate meditation, they'll share songs for contemplation or for dancing, and engage rituals of gathering and community, like sharing food or a communal prayer. This opening activity facilitates exposure to and exploration of each student's particular expression of their spiritual, religious, or philosophical traditions by prompting students to construct a translatable communal ritual rooted in their own tradition, but accessible to outsiders. The student leading the opening activity first introduced, introduces their religious location. They share about who they are and how the ritual stems from their tradition. And they then instruct their peers on how they too can participate in the ritual. And for the most part, everyone joins in, centering and grounding the class in collectivity before beginning class content. The opening spiritual activity requires students to rest even but briefly on a religious or philosophical identity, a task that many students in the name of interreligiosity are hesitant to do. But interreligious engagement hinges upon a deep acknowledgement and understanding of one's own religious location to better understand, respect, and show compassion for the religious location of others. How else might we regain, how else might we gain reverence for the rituals of meaning making across religious difference if we never learn to show reverence for our own? The opening spiritual activity also calls for vulnerability on behalf of the leader and on behalf of their peers. Students leading the opening activity are presenting pieces of their identity, and for some, this may be the first time they offer others a glimpse into their tradition. Trusting peers to reverently hold a piece of one's tradition takes vulnerability, it takes openness, and likewise, students who participate in their peers' opening activities also display a sense of vulnerability. For most, they are stepping out of their own tradition comfort zones and publicly taking part in an activity that may not align with their religious beliefs. But through this activity, students receive exposure to different traditions, to different expressions of traditions, and to new rituals embedded within those traditions. In considering the role of ritual for interreligious chaplains, Rochelle Robbins and Danielle Tumineo Hansen write, quote, rituals engage the whole person, their bodies, spirits, and minds. In a ritual, participants might stand and sit, they might sing, they might hold hands with the person next to him. These embodied experiences, even if done virtually by holding one's hand out to others through the camera, can create a sense of physical safety and relational connection, end quote. So in their interreligious classroom, students experience the benefit of ritual as it facilitates grounding, gathering, and collectivity. And they learn to construct and participate in rituals rooted in traditions and relevant to specific communities. And from their experience of diverse religious rituals in the classroom, they can vulnerably pull ritual into their care practice to facilitate a sense of groundedness and connection amongst their care receivers in their interreligious communities. Toward the middle of the term, students are invited to interview and or shadow a chaplain working within an interreligious space to complete a paper titled, titled A Day in the Life. Interreligious chaplains professionally thrive when well-connected to other chaplains and spiritual care providers in their communities from both similar and differing faith traditions. Likewise, apart from clinical and academic training, hands-on experience, so shadowing or mentorship opportunities, support students and new chaplains in navigating interreligious contexts as new religious professionals. So for this assignment, students locate and interview and or shadow a chaplain working within an interreligious context to learn about the chaplain's institutional role and daily activities. 
Through this assignment, students witness firsthand how public spaces, where chaplains generally occupy, are inherently interreligious spaces, and how chaplains navigate those spaces while holding on to their own identities. United's remote learning model allows for students across the world to join our learning community. But this means the religious diversity in each student's community will differ significantly. The interreligious landscape of the Iowa Plains is vastly different than the interreligious landscape of Miami, Florida. The interreligious literacy needed in New York City differs significantly from the literacy needed in Salt Lake City. And as an instructor, I cannot fit into the syllabus a conversation relating to every religious expression from San Diego to Portland, Maine. <laughs> Yet students need to maintain awareness and knowledge of the religious landscape particular to their communities. Therefore, the interreligious classroom must extend beyond four walls or beyond the Zoom room. So for the A Day in the Life assignment, students are encouraged to interview or shadow a local, cha a local chaplain working in a sector of interest. Because the chaplain is ideally from the student's community, the student is likely to care for similar religious and cultural demographics as their interviewee. So this activity then gets students acquainted with the religious landscape of their communities, not just the Twin Cities, not just generic any town USA, but their local communities, allowing them to better prepare for the religious diversity to come. The networking opportunities that arise out of these interviews are also quite encouraging. Students report having conversations that illumined paths toward their vocational goals as interviewees shared career advice, passed along community contacts, and even offered CPE residency opportunities. Finally, the interreligious peer relationship assignment is what I think is the most important learning activity I present to my students this far. By the end of the first day of class, students are assigned an interreligious peer. They are formed into dyads with a peer who maintains some form of religious, spiritual, or philosophical difference. At times, this may look like a Methodist student paired with a Buddhist student. At times, this may look like a Wiccan student paired with a Hindu student, or perhaps two UCC students are paired together, one with evangelical roots and one who grew up Catholic. Each week, these paired peers meet for about 30 minutes using what I term peer prompts to help guide their conversations. Peer prompts range from discussions about illness and death to articulating how one's tradition substantiates into religious practice. With interreligious peers, students learn to set boundaries and to respect the spiritual and cultural boundaries of others. As the dyads form, students are invited to explicitly name what they hope to accomplish through their peer relationship, what discussion topics are off limits, how they can signal crossed boundaries, and what power dynamics ought to be considered. Setting boundaries at the onset of the interreligious relationship is a trauma-informed approach that not only contributes to productive conversations and equitable relationships, but students learn how to set and respect religious boundaries as a method of trauma-informed care, a skill that can be directly applied to their work in interreligious contexts, especially when caring for those with religious trauma. In addition to setting boundaries, the interreligious peer relationship fosters interrogation of power dynamics within interpersonal relationships with embedded religious difference. Kathleen Greider, one of my seminary professors, notes that, quote, religious location is arguably one of the most potentially inflammatory power dynamics in intergroup contact, end quote. So for Greider, power dynamics are exacerbated by interreligious difference. Therefore, students must contend with the isms that bear privilege and inequality and also contend with religious location and often in particular Christianity that also bears privilege and inequality. Sachi Edwards notes that, quote, an examination of power and privilege are important in any dialogue about identity, religious or otherwise, to prevent further marginalization of subordinate identity participants. She goes on to further say, quote, a critical social justice approach to philosophical analyses of religious identity 
and oppression contextualizes experiences of religious identity within the historical backdrop of Christian cultural domination, end quote. So in the interreligious peer relationship, students can explore religious identity against that historical backdrop of Christian cultural domination and are encouraged to clearly articulate how they are complicit in sustaining Christian privilege, even, or might I say, especially those who no longer identify as Christian. The interreligious peer relationship provides a contained space for students to practice interrogating power dynamics related to religious location so that they may become intimately aware of their own power and privilege as interreligious chaplains. But more than that, the interreligious peer relationship simply encourages students to be in relationship with someone different than them. In a world where religious location is divisive and social isolation is a cultural phenomenon, being in relationship with someone across religious difference beyond classroom platitudes has become a critical experience for students practicing authentic interreligious engagement. And students leave the class not only with a new friend, but with a living, breathing interreligious resource to support them in their chaplaincy work. These three learning activities, the opening spiritual activity, the a day in the life interview, and the interreligious peer relationship, each expose students to diversity in religious practice and expression. The assignments also give space for students to explore vulnerability, reverence, ritual, communal trends, boundaries, and power dynamics along religious lines so that they may become effective chaplains prepared for interreligious engagement in whatever context they choose. As students enter the interreligious classroom, they are greeted by learning activities that foster interreligious exposure and exploration. And so, of course, they may feel excitement and trepidation. They may feel energized by the vast religious exposure that's to come. Or they may feel nervous about experiencing the unknown, potentially exposing themselves to something evil or bizarre. Or perhaps as a religious minority, they begin to dread the thought of divulging their own religious location, wondering if it's safe or if they'll be judged. And they may wonder what they could possibly talk to a stranger about, especially one so different. But when these students become chaplains and enter the interreligious care encounter, they will find that their care receivers have these same wanderings about them yet they will be equipped and prepared to engage. Thank you.